Behold, this child is set for the fall and for the resurrection of many in Israel, and as a sign which shall be contradicted. Words from today's gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Once a man convicted of a crime of which he was innocent had a powerful dream near the beginning of his term of punishment. He was being sent to a penal colony. He found himself before a panel of judges, one of whom brought down the gavel saying, I convict you of a wasted life. The man awoke, convinced he must remedy the situation. But his idea of fixing things amounted to escaping prison in order to live a better life. And he spent all of his time trying to break free of his constraints. Very human response. He was innocent of the crime after all. Who can blame him? But this story tells us something about the tension, the contradiction that is present in the world. The convict had the means present to live a virtuous life by simply embracing his term of punishment, whether deserved or not, and suffering it willingly. Many saints passed through prison. Many became saints by embracing their prison sentence, whether just or unjust. Alexander Solzhenitsyn recounted how an older lady, after being thrown into the Russian gulag, was asked what she was in for. That was one of the first questions they asked everybody who came in. What are you in for? How long are you in for? And so they asked her, what are you in for? She said, for my sins. And then when they asked, well, how long are you here for? She said, until they're expiated. She was soon released while everyone else trudged on to fulfill their 10 or 25 years, complaining all the way. Had this convicted man embraced his sentence, he could no longer be convicted of wasting his life. Instead, he dreamed of a situation in which he would be free and ended up wasting all of his time trying to fulfill his dream, sort of like chasing after that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You never seem to get it. Now, in a sense, this very same tension is found in His Majesty, our blessed Lord, because from His very conception in the virgin's womb, it is commonly held and believed by the doctors and the saints and the mystics, such as St. Thomas Aquinas, and many others, that our blessed Lord was both comprehensor and viator. Comprehensor and viator at the same time. As a comprehensor, he possessed in the higher faculties of his human soul the beatific vision of God. Listen to Pope Pius XII, Mystici Corpus Christi, a document on the church, an encyclical letter. He wrote... That knowledge, which is called vision, he possessed in such fullness that in breadth and clarity it far exceeds the beatific vision of all the saints in heaven. Wow, Pope Pius XII. He goes on to say in the same document, this beatific vision of God he enjoyed in the bosom of the mother of God from the conception. So in his human intellect and will, he was already comprehending God from the moment of conception. Comprehensor. Now as a viator, he was, to our utter astonishment and consternation, able to suffer huh, in the lower soul and in his body. He possessed heaven and yet was on the way to heaven. The immense glory of beatitude was compressed and contained, as it were, in the upper regions of the soul without being allowed to overflow into the lower ones, thereby enabling those lower regions to be truly subject to a most painful passion and death. Unlike the innocent convict living for a dream, 
part of his majesty already possessed the vision, but embraced the path required for the whole man to receive its full effects. And that path required embracing the present reality such that there was never even a single wasted moment in the entire life of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not a single wasted moment from the moment of his conception. Now, after reaching the end with his whole being, his whole body and soul resurrected and glorified, this same tension has now passed. It was relieved of Christ. Now it's passed into his mystical body, the church. Thus, the church is partly in heaven, huh? As a comprehensor and partly on earth and under the earth as a viator, able to suffer and in some sense to die. Thus, the church can go through a passion. She can seemingly die, be buried. The saints have talked about this. Thus, we have the church triumphant and the church militant along with the church suffering. We could also note how the church, even on earth, possesses the truth without error in her upper reaches, that is, in the church's deposit of the faith, protected and preserved by the gift of infallibility from all the machinations of the devil and the ragings and emotions of man. Thus, she is, as it were, a comprehensor in part, even as she's passing through the earth. Not surprisingly, then, we should consider how this same tension is shared by the members of the church as each one works out his salvation. We have faith, we have hope, we have charity, faith and hope in the upper regions of our soul and the intellect such that we embrace the truth and see that there is a beatific end for the members of Christ's mystical body. Faith has eyes focused on heaven. Faith, its object is the one truth who is God. But on the other hand, we also have other eyes, as you know well, eyes of the body that tend to have a look around at things on the earth. And how easy it is to whittle away our time with those human eyes to look at things we're not supposed to to distract us from our journey up to heaven. But we have yet another eye that's even in a sense more distracting, and that's the eye of our imagination, with which we easily dream of some ideal life, or ideal place, ideal parish, ideal family, ideal friends, ideal priest, ideal sermon. Forever trying to escape the present meritorious reality, Think of how many merits you're gaining by listening to a long sermon. No, I want it to be shorter. That's how we are. And thereby we dream. We end up thinking about things and wasting our time. We end up like that poor convict, wasting our viator time, trying to avoid being accused of a wasted life by ending with much time lost. We're trying not to waste our life But due to our imagination and our human eyes, we easily whittle away our lives. Now, sadly, we can also add a few more onto this. How many people today don't even care about the potentiality of such an accusation, but rather just want to enjoy the world? And they live as if they were forever of the world. What a pity. Someday they will hear those words, I convict you of a wasted life. What is even worse is how many today have obstinately denied some doctrine of the faith. Say, for example, the virgin birth of our Lord or the perpetual virginity of Our Lady and have thereby lost their faith. If they're obstinate about it, they lose their faith. Making what they have left to be mere opinion. Some of their opinions are right. They agree with the church, but some of their opinions don't. Cannot have it both ways. Listen to St. Thomas Aquinas. 
He says, someone who obstinately disbelieves one single article of the faith is not prepared to follow the teachings of the church in all things. Therefore, it is clear that such a man in denying one article has no faith in the other articles, but only a kind of opinion in accordance with his own will. St. Thomas, we cannot deny one single article of the faith without losing our faith. No wonder we get in unending disputes with such people, our relatives and friends who have left the church. We get in these unending disputes. Why? Because they have no faith. They're not operating on faith, but on opinion. They're not seeing with the eyes of faith. They have no comprehension. And as a result, they no longer are viators either. They've stopped the journey. And they're wasting their lives. We need to avoid that happening to us. Now, just consider a few stories for a moment how in the history of the church, there are numerous occasions when the dead have been brought back to life. These stories are amazing. What is striking about nearly all of these raisings from the dead is how many of them died again shortly after being raised, after they had to perform some duty or receive some needed sacrament that they failed to receive before dying. This happened even after they were given the opportunity to stay alive, to take up the path once again as a viator. An example would be how once St. Vincent Ferrer, who is known to have raised some 30 people from the grave, he stopped a funeral procession on his way to the graveyard in order to command the dead person to rise up and witness to a court case in which all seemed lost. The man rose up as commanded and he proclaimed openly the innocence of the accused party. And then St. Vincent asked him if he would prefer to stay alive. He could if he wanted to. He said, no, thanks. My salvation is secured. At other times, little dead babies were raised from death. They were baptized because they they died before being baptized. They were born stillborn or something. St. Joan of Arc happened to her once, came to this town, little stillborn baby laid out before our Lady's statue. The people all praying sorrowfully that it was not baptized came alive, yawned three times, baptized, died. These souls had completed their viator time. The mystic, Venerable Mother Mary of Agrida, says at the Holy Innocents, today's feast, little children were elevated by the request of Our Lady. They were elevated to the state of reason and willingly laid down their life for the Lord and became little saints. Now, what is all this telling us? These souls had completed their viator time and they did not need to return to it again, nor did they want to. In other words, they had come to know that the comprehensor life is more to be valued than the viator life. How many of us act as if our viator life is all we have or is more valuable? From the Annals of Lourdes, we find this story. Ellie Eau Claire, an ex-soldier, developed Pott's disease. That's a tuberculosis of the spine, very painful. He developed this after his war service. A complete atheist and violent foe of religion, he had married a devout Catholic girl to whom he was deeply attached. But he scoffed at her faith and said he would rid their children of all that nonsense just as soon as they were old enough to reason. Then this terrible illness came upon him. His wife spoke to him of going to Lourdes, and Eau Claire hooted at the idea. He, a free thinker, go to Lourdes? Never! And he said, I forbid you ever to bring a priest to me. He thundered, if I know of it and have strength enough, I will drive him away. Sometime later, he happened to see Paul Merat, a young boy who had been cured of the same malady, Pott's disease, at Lourdes a couple of months before. Eau Claire was deeply impressed. 
he thought perhaps the Lord's water did indeed have some curative qualities. He finally consented to go. When you're in pain, you start thinking things over. Once there, he was moved by the simplicity and the faith of those around him. He saw that there was more to it than just curative water. Wondering at himself, he began to pray. Two days later, his abscesses had dried up. Mobility returned to his spine. His wounds healed up. Eau Claire, who had come to Lourdes on a stretcher, returned home walking free from pain. Within a month, he resumed his work as a blacksmith. He was a changed man, a radiant Christian, no less living his faith and overwhelmed by what God had done for him. But he kept saying, my past is terribly stained. I was an enemy of God. What have I done that he should grant me such a grace? He had compunction. He realized he lived a wasted life. In a few months, he began to feel pain again. He said, it is only just that God should try my faith since I have been such a great sinner and have denied his existence. He returned twice to Lourdes, but did not improve. He developed new abscesses and grew worse. He accepted whatever came as God's will, as suffering visited upon him. He said, because of my faults, he had increased Christ's suffering, he said, on the cross, so now he would embrace suffering for love of him, accepting it all cheerfully, not allowing any complaints to escape his lips even unto his dying day. Our blessed lady showed me the right road, he said. That was sufficient. I shall never forget it. He died holding his Lord's medal and his crucifix with his face radiating joy. No wasted life here. No trying to escape into some dream world here. Faith and hope tell us that we have a home in heaven, a place where we see God face to face. We are meant to be complete comprehensors for all eternity, but to reach that home, the church triumphant, we must not lose our way as viators in the church militant, lest we be convicted of a wasted life. To keep on the path as viators, we must first and foremost keep our faith intact in our intellects as a, so to speak, comprehensors on the way. This is required. You cannot love if you don't believe. It's a false love without true faith. This requires that we study at this time, especially when there's so many errors floating around the world, we're breathing them in, in the air around us. You will not maintain your viator status if you don't study. So this coming year, let us resolve to spend part of our day strengthening our faith by study and reading good Catholic books. Even if only for a little while, Read something every day. Build up your faith. It will not be a waste of time. Let us now say a Hail Mary to Our Lady, Mediatrix of all graces, to beg of her to preserve in our souls until death our pearl of great prize, our Catholic faith. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.